Hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Ling, and this is the Road to a Vaccine, an exploration of the COVID-19 crisis and the global community's efforts to develop a vaccine against the disease. You have probably noticed that I am in a different place from where I usually do the show, and that is because I am in quarantine in a hotel in northern Oklahoma, as I was exposed to someone who tested positive for COVID early last week. I have since tested negative seven, seven days after exposure, but I am just following the proper protocols as everyone who gets exposed should. Because we are now over eight months into this pandemic, which is not showing any signs of abating, I know we are all feeling the fatigue, but many have grown lax with regard to safety precautions. And as I've traveled over the past couple of weeks, I've been to places where people are not wearing masks in public at all. Now, wherever you are on the spectrum, the fact is that COVID-19 is still very much uh, a public health threat as it has ever been. And I just wanna reiterate what the experts are telling us. Hang in there. Do not let your guard down. As Dr. Matt McCarthy so eloquently said on our previous show, we have to respect the virus and keep up the safety measures for ourselves and particularly for our loved ones. It does make a difference. And that is what this show is all about. We are here to give you access to the top health officials uh, in the world and we are live. So you can ask your questions uh, on top of your mind. This is access that you won't find anywhere else and I urge you to join the conversation. Put your questions in the comment section and I will do my best to get them answered. Now let's look at the current numbers. We are over 40 million cases worldwide, over 1.1 million deaths and over 220,000 deaths in the US alone. In India, cases are continuing to rise and experts warn that if public health guidelines are not tightened as winter approaches, India could see up to 2.6 million cases per month. In the past week, COVID cases in the US have increased by 30% with the upper Midwest leading in the growing number of cases. Now at this juncture on the road to a vaccine, we're hearing about vaccine candidates in phase three trials. And the discussion has turned to people asking, would I take a COVID-19 vaccine? Today, we are going to address vaccine hesitancy, how this will impact us once there is a vaccine and why clinical trials are so important and why we need diversity in them. We have another incredible lineup for you today. We have Dr. Paul Stoffels and he will update us on J&J's investigational vaccine. Then Dr. Cato Lorenzen from the University of Connecticut will talk to us about COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy in black American communities. And then Ayub Katak from Q Health will share his COVID-19 rapid testing technology and show us how it works. But first we have Dr. Paul Stoffels, J&J's Chief Scientific Officer with us today. Dr. Stoffels, welcome back to the show. Now it was recently announced that J&J has paused its clinical trials. Several COVID-19 trials have also gone into pause and, and we know this is normal but understandably, uh, the public uh, is, is very anxious at this time. So can you explain why pauses in trials happen and what it means for the overall trial? Uh, thank you, Lisa. So pauses happen because sometimes in clinical trials, we have serious uh, adverse events which are unexpected. And if they are unexpected, we take the time to evaluate uh, first whether yes or no they are related to the product to the vaccine in this case and then we work with the dsmb the data safety monitoring board which is an independent body uh, who oversees our trial to discuss or to provide them with the information and judge independently from us whether they are related yes or no to the vaccine Following that, we interact with the regulatory authorities, the FDA, EMA, and other regulatory authorities in the world to go to them and say, hey, we saw a CSSOS event, it's, it's unrelated or it's related. Um, should we continue to do the um, clinical trial, yes or no, and expose more people? And that's a normal procedure which we do in all clinical trials we do at J&J &J and in most of the pharmaceutical companies is that when you have a serious adverse event, you pause your study and that could take a few days or even a week or 10 days. And then you go forward after a full evaluation. And this is to fully protect the people who are volunteering to come into clinical trials and, and, and want us to make sure that they don't take too much risk in this and that we can assess together with DSMB and FDA the right risk for people uh, or the right risk uh, benefit for the trial to continue. Mm. There, there is such a microscope on, on these trials, obviously, because as I mentioned, the public is just so 
uh, anxious uh, for as much information as possible about this particular vaccine trial. But but these kinds of pauses have have always happened for any number of clinical trials for any number of of, uh, of vaccines. Is that correct? Yes, we 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 do this in in oncology trials, in in neuroscience trials. We do it in all types of trials, and it's and it's normal. But we have committed to being fully transparent, and the public is now part of the full clinical trial process. And that's where they will go to the good and the bad of a clinical trial, where there are sometimes this type of things happening. But people have to understand it's it's for the good of the product, but also especially in for the good of people to fully understand what is happening and. This is a normal process and hopefully very quickly we'll be back on track, but that's what we have to do to, to assure that we do it clinical trials safe and effective. Uh, now, Dr. Stoffels, last week you participated in a press conference with Dr. Francis Collins, where the NIH announced a new investigational treatment for COVID-19 that will be entering also phase three trials that could possibly quell the cytokine storm that triggers a lot of COVID's negative impacts, particularly lung issues. Can you tell us more about this treatment uh, and, and the active trials that are underway? Yeah, but two things here. Active is a collaboration between um, the, the NIH, NIAID, and all the scientific institutions in the US combined with uh, BARDA, FDA, and EMAR, and the industry where we, in a systematic way, evaluate all of the different potential therapies, whether it's for antivirals, antibodies, supportive therapy, or, or like in this case, uh, drugs which could suppress the cytokine storm. And they are into several different active studies. We have five different uh, projects there with five different types of evaluation. And this is especially one where we, where the combined, um, the collaboration evaluates uh, products, uh, new drugs or existing drugs into cyt cytokine storm. And that's where these are very well controlled clinical trials on significant number of people in order to establish the clean efficacy benefit benefit risk of these products. And in this case, it is about Remicades uh, in Flixima, which is a um, TNF uh, tumor necrosis factor inhibitor, which has been used uh, in more than 3 million people, has been studied in several hundred thousand people, which significant follow up uh, for a very long time. Uh, but this this is the last stage of, of COVID where you first typically you get exposed, you get infected, then those people who are very sensitive, who get very sick, they have then um, uh, replication in the lung. And when that's over, the lung sometimes continues to have an inflammatory reaction, which goes forward. And it's for those people that we need specific drugs to keep, keep that under control. And all, many drugs are being used, but few are very systematically evaluated. And that's what Active uh, One, the project which we are starting with the NIH, is now uh, evaluating three different products under which one is, um, which is Remicade, our product. It's always um, exciting to hear about promising new uh, therapeutics that, that could become available. Um, Dr. Stoffels, I have a question from David from Facebook who asks, will the vaccine come out in wave distributions like the elderly first? Well, um, vaccines, um, there will be several vaccines, hopefully which will reach uh, uh, the people in the world. And, uh, but the, I think the healthcare um, authorities in most of the countries, they, are, they agree that we should prevent the highest, the risk people first from getting infected because that's where the mortality is of the disease. And if that could happen, if we could get mortality under control with vaccinating first the highest risk people, and that's typically the elder or people with comorbidities, um, that would be a big relief to the whole society. And then later on in the months following that, getting to the broader population to um, to reduce transmission as well as new infections and hopefully uh, completely uh, get rid of the virus in the world. But first, um, healthcare workers and high risk people and following that um, um, high risk people at high risk for dying or getting a severe disease and following that the rest of the population. I think that's a very logic and human approach to, to get uh, the vaccine implemented. And on that note, Dr. Stoffels, are there elderly people who are participating in the vaccine trials? Yes. 
Yes, absolutely. The vaccine trials are a very diverse uh, population and especially focused on elderly. There are uh, people recruiting in, in nursing homes, in elderly homes, as well as people um, uh, who have higher risk, cardiovascular risk, diabetes. Uh, the people who are at risk, they are the uh, key focus of uh, recruitment for the clinical trials. Um, as well as diversity of the world. As you know, we do the study in North America, in Latin America, but also in, in uh, South Africa. And that gives a very broad population targeted to recruit 60,000 people. And we do especially 60,000 people to get a very diverse population to establish safety and efficacy in all parts of the population. Dr. Stoffels, we're, we're heading into the holiday season. And of course, we all wanna be with our families. So. Let's talk about the CDC's warning that small gatherings are increasingly becoming a source of COVID-19 infection around the country. What do we need to do as individuals to stay safe during this winter surge? Well, it's it's very unfortunate then you know, what you say is that we should not break, get down with the guard. The risk, the virus has not slowed down, has not become less pathogenic. Uh, we, we have learned a little bit better how to treat sick patients and therefore mortality has been better under control, but still it's a very serious disease. So the classic way of what we have been doing is social distancing, um, wear your mask in, in, in gatherings, but also wash your hands and make sure that you don't have any form of transmission and in your family or if you have a gathering, um, the normal distancing is needed for, for going forward. And I think through the winter until we have a vaccine and we have to get used to it. Um, unfortunately, if you want to protect your family and especially the higher risk people in your own family, make sure you, t you observe the rules because um, you could have bad luck and one of your family members could die. And I don't think that's uh, that's the objective of a family gathering. Let's make sure we stay all safe and observe all the rules. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Stoffels, Paul from LinkedIn is asking this question. I'm not sure if you, you are able to answer this, but how has COVID-19 fared in Australia and Southern Hemisphere countries? Uh, as we in the U.S. and North and the Northern Hemisphere have fared, and as we are about to enter winter months amidst flu concerns. Well, you, you have seen the surge in certain provinces of of Australia at a certain point. The flu concern is very is is very challenging because, um, of course, flu gives fever, flu creates sickness, and the different the differential diagnosis between flu and corona is not that easy all the time. So people need to go for testing if they have fever uh, in order to to rule out whether it's flu or or corona, um, and so that will be a concern. Um, but the the inf the 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 combination of winter um and and flu and corona will will bring a very difficult challenge in the next few months and that's where i think all of us should be even more rigorous in observing uh, prevention prevention of transmission in order to not have more challenge in the healthcare systems and uh, i'm in europe and what you see there now since a few weeks uh, schools reopened um, colleges reopened and people are more inside huge surge again in the whole uh, in the whole European community, even more now than in the US. Whole hospitals are getting prepared. Some hospitals have already more patients than they had in March of this year at the beginning of the pandemic. So it's absolutely not showing any slowdown and we should not joke. Uh, this is like really serious and we could have more deaths in the next part of this pandemic than we had in the past. So testing, social distancing, and uh, making sure that you protect yourself. Uh, and if you don't do it for yourself, also do it for the others. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Umesh from LinkedIn who asks, would a vaccine be needed for people who have already been affected by COVID? It's a very good question. Um, we don't know. We are still learning whether normally not. If people are affected by COVID, then typically you have a, we have a natural protection. What we don't know yet is how long it lasts. And the virus at the moment for COVID is quite stable. So it's not like with flu where we have every year and all, we don't know yet, but we, we don't see a much of variation. So hopefully if people who are infected will not get it anymore, but we'll learn that in the next few months, the, the disease is nine months old 
Uh, there are some cases where you have already reinfection uh, documented, but that's not that frequent yet. So hopefully people don't need to be vaccinated. But most probably people who are vaccinated will need a boost um, after a certain time. And we have to learn when that is. And that's also part of our study. But at the moment, we have not enough information to decide or, or to learn yet whether people will need to be vaccinated. But hopefully not. Hopefully natural uh, natural protection will give protection enough for the long time. And my last question, Dr. Stoffels, in, in the beginning of this show, I mentioned that people are really feeling so much fatigue uh, with regard to this virus. Um, you are in Europe, and I, I know you just talked about how there has been a surge um, because they've opened up so many parts of, of their economy. Um, but are people there where you are continuing to take it as seriously and complying with guidelines? Because as you know, in parts of the United States, um, there are people who are undermining uh, the severity of the disease and, and even mocking our, our public health officials. No. Um, in Europe, it's, it's much more, let's say, moderate there. The, a lot of, most of the people, many people respect the, respect the rules. Yeah? And of course, you always have to control to, uh, but now kids go to school, they learn about uh, Corona, they have to wear their masks in school, they, they do it at home, they know that with their grandparents, they know in social. Also, going back to sports events, for example, is only possible when you totally observe the rules. Yeah? And, and that's where people learn how to cope with it. And I think a balanced re, let's say a balanced reopening of what is possible from social events, uh, sports events, but also cultural events, hopefully can give some mitigation to the fatigue. But uh, the fatigue should not result for many of us, uh, for many people, into a highly deadly disease, uh, bringing into the family and losing one of your family members. And I think that's still the most important, the most important objective is to keep healthy with the family and, and your environment. So, and that's what you do, Lisa, now protecting yourself, but also protecting your family by going in quarantine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Dr. Soffels, it's always so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. We look forward to hearing uh, from you more in future episodes. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Now, in case you're just joining us, you're watching The Road to a Vaccine, and we're talking to the world's leading scientists and taking your questions along the way. Now, as we know, there are multiple vaccines in phase three clinical trials, and that's important uh, for participants to also reflect diversity in those trials in age and race uh, in this population. And there are challenges to achieving this that, um, that we need to really be addressing. So I'd like to welcome back to the show, Dr. Cato Lorenzen, professor at the University of Connecticut. Dr. Lorenzen, it's so nice to see you again. Uh, now, vaccine hesitancy is something that we are facing here in the U.S., and it's fairly widespread among Black Americans. Can you explain why this is the case and the origins of that lack of trust? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be back here again. Um, my disclosures are I'm a, I am a consultant for uh, Johnson & Johnson. Um, well, the, the distrust is, let me just say parenthetically and give a, a little bit of background in terms of in terms of blacks in America and COVID-19, in case the audience doesn't know. Number one, um, three times, uh, there are three times higher rate of, uh, of COVID-19 infections in blacks and whites. The uh, 4.7 times the rate of serious illness and hospitalization. And the death rate is twice as high in blacks and whites. So it's a, it's a uh, real crisis in the black community. Um, and those numbers are, are much like the numbers that we first reported. We had the first paper in the referee literature on COVID-19 and Blacks and reported those, uh, those numbers and those rates. Now, let me also make it very, very clear that um, Blacks respect this pandemic. Um, and if one looks at uh, statistics about regarding um, levels of, uh, of concern about the pandemic, levels about concern about COVID-19, Blacks typically have higher rates of concern about the pandemic than whites. Uh, blacks also, uh, if one examines um, uh, respect for CDC and the CDC guidelines in terms of using a mask, et cetera, Blacks typically poll higher in terms of their respect for the CDC 
and their respect in terms of using um, proper equipment in terms of protection. So placing that in, in, in context. And also, a Black person is twice as likely knowing, a, knowing someone who has died of COVID-19. A Black person is twice as likely knowing that. So Blacks are, you know, take this disease and this, and this uh, pandemic very, very seriously here in America. Um, and so where the does the, the we, vaccine hesitancy come from? Yeah. The issue that we have is mistrust in the medical system. And that mistrust comes from a number of different directions. Uh, the first, of course, is historical. And the historical, uh, the historical way in which Blacks have been treated by the medical system from uh, 1800s in terms of slavery in, in which you know, enslaved people were, were basically tortured in terms of slavery without anesthesia to the, the Tuskegee study, which is the longest non-therapeutic trial that we think of being something in ancient history, but was ended only in the 1970s, um, to what we continue to see in terms of implicit bias and racism that's been documented in terms of, uh, in terms of medical treatment now. We see that even right now in terms of the COVID, in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, when we see the rates in which Blacks have been tested versus whites, um, the, the levels of, uh, of illness that it takes for a Black person to get into a hospital versus not. And so these, uh, these areas um, have, have, uh, have had an effect. But there's another effect. And the other effect that we have to understand is that what happens with institutions around medicine has an effect on uh, on trust of the medical system. Uh, a number of studies, the most prominent by Lang, showed that when pr police brutality and racial profiling takes place, that institution of policing loses trust. And then concomitant inst institutions, such as the medical institutions around the, uh, in the uh, environment, also lose trust. He studied individuals who had undergone discrimination by police, looked at their level of, of mistrust of the medical system, and there's a correlation there. And so, so from a number of different standpoints, it's not only just an issue in terms of the medical system, but it's a systemic issue about where we are as a country. You know, when we look, when we examine the, the percentages and the levels of individuals who were uh, were uh, interested in utilizing a vaccine, uh, in May it was about 54 percent of uh, blacks. It still was low that uh, that uh, said that they would uh, that they would uh, uh, utilize a vaccine. It's now plummeted to 32 percent, and it's plummeted to 32 percent. I think for a number of reasons. Number one, that obviously the medical mistrust is there, but also we've now we're in the world of uh, George Floyd, and so we have other institutions that uh, that also breed medical mistrust, and there is a cross fertilization of that medical mistrust that's taking place. And, and Dr. Lorenzen, where do conspiracy theories play into this? A, a recent Cambridge study looked at beliefs and attitudes in five different countries and identified specific conspiracy theories that that um, are, are, are really prevalent. So can you talk about that study's findings? And if a COVID vaccine is critical for achieving herd immunity, how do we overcome these conspiracy theories and, and build enough trust so that people will go get vaccinated? Well, you know, I don't, I don't know whether for Black people in America, whether the conspiracy theories are, are of, of, of note. I think it's really medical mistrust of the system. I, I read the paper, and so, um, first of all, they, they grouped everyone under minority, which I have, as the editor of the Journal of Racial and Ethnic Health Disparities, I have a problem when people group a group as minority versus non-minority. But, um, but what they found was that the group that was under minority actually, you know, they absorbed and felt more of the conspiracy theories, but most of the, in most of the countries, it didn't change their view of whether they were going to get a vaccine or not. And so um, I think the conspiracy theories are there. I don't think that those, that's the major issue that's there. Now, with that said, I think that um, that misinformation um, is, um, is something that is uh, an important factor. Black people in America are barraged with misinformation. Um, right now, we're going through the, a period of, of what's called black voter depression, uh, where the system, you know, systems are working against blacks in America to not vote in terms of making the decision not to vote. It's not voter suppression, it's voter depression taking place in terms of, and that's one example of what black people have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the information that's, that's coming in.
as you remember when we wrote the first paper i was prompted to work write the first paper because on the internet across the internet was a uh, a myth of black immunity to covid 19. of course nothing could be further from the truth and we we were looking to see where these uh, where these uh these stories suddenly came out onto the internet but uh misinformation uh about covid 19 um i think contributed greatly to the um to the numbers of, of blacks uh, that uh, contracted the COVID and died of COVID-19. So we see uh, we see um, policies that, that involve um, uh, misinformation and um, and you know even on the voter side, voter depression. We can see in the news even even today, and I think that that does play a role. However, it's really the history of of what's going on in terms of um, in terms of mistrust, medical mistrust. Despite attempts to suppress voting, I have been heartened to see record numbers of Black Americans showing up to vote early in, in cities across this country. Um, Dr. Dr. Lorenzen, I just want to talk about the reticence um, in Black populations to participate in vaccine clinical trials. Why is it so important to have diverse representation, including Black people and the elderly in these trials? Right. Well, again, there, I guess there are three, there are three, three important areas. Uh, the medical mistrust in terms of mistrust of the system also um, uh, spills over to, uh, to uh, trials. Obviously, the longest non-therapeutic trial in the history of mankind was actually a trial on black people, where they were brought into the trial being told that there was a benefit for them. And there was no benefit for them. In fact, it was to their detriment. And so um, these types of clinical trials um, have existed. Uh, and uh, have, a, have a detriment. It's important on a number of different fronts for blacks and, um, and you know, people, blacks, indigenous, and people of color to be involved in clinical trials. Number, number one is that diverse groups may have different, have different nuanced effects in terms of uh, vaccines and understanding them is important. Number two, if we don't uh, have um, black and brown people in clinical trials and the vaccines approved, then um, black and brown people will go undergo what I call the real clinical trial. It's the real clinical trial is when it, they're, they're exposed to it for the first time in a population in which there is not that much surveillance, may not be the, the level of surveillance taking place if, it, if they were in a clinical trial. And the third important reason is that the more individuals and more blacks, more Latinos that can be uh, others can, that, who are in clinical trials, the more ambassadors you have, the more people in the community who can state um, look, I'm I'm in a clinical trial. I'm doing well, and um, and uh, and this has been helpful. And one could have ambassadors for for this. We've been talking since the beginning of this pandemic, Dr. Lorenzen, uh, about how communities of color have just been hit so hard by COVID. We are now over eight months in this pandemic, and I, I'm just wondering. If you can just explain the measures that need to be taken to try and address this. Well, the, the, those measures are, are, are in different levels. First of all, uh, we need to make sure that we have universal testing and testing has been woefully bad. It's gotten better, but still in the black and brown communities, it's still very, it's still low. Number two is that we need to change the way, and I've been advocating this from day one, the way in which we think about treatment. Um, I saw a sheet that, that gave instructions to an individual to individuals about when to come to the hospital. And the instruction said, if your lips are blue, come into the hospital. Well, if your lips are blue uh, and you've got COVID-19, you should have been in the hospital earlier than that. And so we need to rethink how in America we do treatment. We need to do treatment and like in Wuhan and other areas where if someone's sick, they come to a pop-up tent hospital, they get, before they, their O2 sats go down, they get oxygen, they get steroids. Basically, the Donald Trump treatment, the President Trump treatment, they should be getting up front. Every American should be getting that proactively before symptoms get worse and develop. And we need, and, and that needs to be, uh, that needs to be done. But I want to emphasize this, and this is very important. But every manufacturer, every company that's involved with making vaccines needs to embrace the black community right now. I gave a keynote speech or a plenary speech at the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America um, a few days ago. And of course, one of my disclosures was that I'm a consultant for Johnson & Johnson. 
And they said, where's Johnson Johnson? Why aren't they here? Where is this company that's making that's Why aren't they here as a part of what the thought leaders that are here, the black thought leaders that are here embracing and working with individuals? So now is the time that uh, that the the scientific community, the black scientific community, National Medical Association, W. Montague Cobb and Health Institute, the HBCUs, the black medical schools need to be embraced and need to embrace, embrace not only acutely, but also for a long period of time. There needs to be investments in or in these organizations for considerable periods of time. And that's one way to build trust and build confidence in, in terms of the system. Excellent points, Dr. Lorenzen. Um, I so appreciate you coming on our show and please come back again. Really always uh, appreciate your insights. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. You are watching The Road to a Vaccine. We are live and it's great to see all the viewer questions coming in. And I know you will definitely have more for our next guest. He's the founder and CEO of Q Health, which JJDC, a, a division of J&J, &J, was an early investor in and which has an innovative new COVID-19 testing system. Welcome, uh, Ayub Katak. I am so anxious to hear about your system. Now, Q is making a rapid portable COVID-19 testing platform. Where will it be available? Can I get one um, in, in the US, around the world? And tell us how it works and how is it different from uh, the testing methods that are currently available? Yeah, so the, um, the first of all, thanks for having me on. Um, so this is the key system. It's a uh, portable um, battery operated and then this is the COVID-19 test cartridge. So to operate it, you insert the cartridge into the reader um, you take a, a lower nostril swab like that, and then you insert into um, into the cartridge, and the test starts automatically. So once the test is complete, which takes about 20 minutes, the results um, appear on the mobile device in the Q Health app. So the the test is um, quite a fast test, but I think that in general people have um, you know have this dichotomy. The public thinks okay, so there's either slow and accurate lab testing or rapid and you know with some trade-offs. And so what our tests, what we think our test you know brings to the table is that now there's a very sensitive and easy to use test that also, you know, it's it's not only deployable in many different settings, but it has the the accuracy of the of, of the lab tests or comparable accuracy. So actually just very recently Mayo Clinic performed a independent study on our platform and they got very good uh, concordance with the lab methods. Um, so that study is going to be published soon. Um, but this is part of the underpinning of us saying, you know, the, the growing body of data that shows that the platform is, is quite sensitive um, to detecting COVID. And so it doesn't have um, sort of the trade-off that people are starting to think about when they think about rapid versus um, laboratory tests. In terms of and, availability, uh, Ayub, yeah. Good. Yeah, Ayub, I mean, it, uh, this could potentially be such a game changer because uh, for the PCR tests, I mean, it, it, it takes time uh, to be sent to the lab and to get the results. So um, do you think that your test, individuals we will be able to, to, to own this test and be able to test regularly? Yeah. The, we're currently scaling up to much higher levels. Uh, you know, we we just announced a partnership with Department of Defense and um, Health and Human Services. Uh, this really is an extension from what we had been doing previously with BARDA, um, which is another you know, government agency, to get this product as available to people as possible. So the government, um, you know, is going to be distributing these tests, uh, six million of them, to the people so that they can get more access and um, helping us scale up the capacity to 100,000 units, 100,000 test cartridges per day, which is significant. Uh, I mean, if you think about the total number of tests that were, you know, have been performed on average in the United States, you're looking at, you know, anywhere from 700,000 to 1.1 million tests per day in all of the United States. So 100,000 represents a significant, you know, um, increase, 10%. Uh, of, of that. Um, so making our tests more available is kind of the primary mission of, of our partnership with the government. And so what we will be able to do is get this into more Americans' hands. Um, and 
um, eventually, you know, hopefully globally as well. So that's really the focus um, of getting, of, you know, we really are trying to make this more available. And, and we just talked to Dr. Lorenzen about how testing is just, um, it is not accessible on a widespread level to so many communities of color. So um, how, how and when do you think this test will become available for, for all communities, particularly those that are underserved? I think that's gonna, you know, with the government uh, partnership and the ability to distribute these 6 million tests, uh, you know, we will be making subsequent announcements, working very closely with the government um, to help establish exactly where our particular tests can add the most value. I mean, you know, the government's uh, definitely rolled out a lot of testing um, with the you know, rapid antigen tests and, um, and generally testing has become a, a lot more available than it was early on in the pandemic. And um, and so you know the, the we'll make subsequent announcements to to indicate exactly where they're going. Uh, I, um, we have a question from Tejo Wanisi from LinkedIn, who's asking, "Is this device one-time use?" I think she might mean, "Can you use this every day?" So the the reader itself is actually um, so this part is um, durable, so you can use this many times, um, and thousands or more. And the cartridge itself is a single use. So this is disposed of. So the, the swab is locked in with a cartridge and the skin can be thrown away. So currently this test is available for um, authorized you know, medical personnel. Um, we, we have a point of care designation from the FDA for emergency use authorization. And so, it's it's available in, in doctor's offices and and these um, and so they have the reader and and um, and then they have the one time use cartridges that they can dispose of. Um, yeah, so it is it is with a combination of both single single use and durable. And and can you just give us a sense of the many kinds of tests that are currently available to people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's. You know, early on in the in the pandemic, you had um, the first tests that were coming out were like the CDC tests, and these are you know, laboratory PCR type tests. Um, and many of the sort of traditional manufacturers of uh, tests for things like flu um, were the ones to quickly get you know into the testing um, you know arena to to make the make you know just boost capacity nationally. And so those are the first to, to become available. Is really at the laboratory level. And those are run all based off of a method called PCR or, or something very similar, where they're using amplification um, of the genetic material of the virus to to detect the virus, um, to detect the presence of the virus in uh, samples. And so, you know, laboratory methods generally rely on nucleic acid amplification. So that means they're amplifying genetic material and detecting it. And then um, the first tests that you know started to become available at the point of care. Um, things like the Abbott ID Now, Cepheid, um, those uh, were the first to emerge, and those can be used at you know, doctors' offices anywhere where there's a what they call a CLIA waiver, which um, you know is essentially a, uh, allows even doctors' offices to perform tests. And then um, then there's a new class of tests called antigen tests, which detect. That, that don't actually detect the genetic material, they detect some sort of protein within the virus. Um, so it, there's no amplification step. So the, the benefit of those is that they tend to be less expensive and easier to manufacture um, versus the molecular tests, uh, either in the lab or in the um, point of care, but, but especially the point of care. Um, so our test is in this sort of category with um, the Cepheid, where you have the amplification, but you also have it you know, available in the point of care, so it is more deployable. Um, and so th that's kind of the spectrum. It goes from laboratory testing, uh, which is using amplification, um, to point of care using amplification or um, antigen rapid antigen tests, which don't use um, amplification and just detect a protein uh, within the virus. Uh, we have a question from Chris from LinkedIn who asks, can this technology be used in the future for uh, testing of other things 
uh, than just COVID. So, so we've been developing this technology and this platform for um, about a decade now. And so uh, actually in the lead up to coronavirus, the, the previous two years, we had been working with BARDA, Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority, to develop this product, this platform for home use influenza testing. Um, and this really was in preparation for a pandemic that you know would be of influenza in nature. We also ha um, had an option uh, for, within this um, agreement with BARDA to, to, if there were something emerged that we could be responsive to that and, and start to develop because you know, they understood that our platform um, was capable of testing different types of things. So the, when coronavirus started to emerge, the reports of it and the genome was published, we quickly began working on it and we had a coronavirus test fairly quickly. So coronavirus wasn't our first test. Um, we had flu in clinical validation. So it was actually in clinical studies. Um, and, and that was, so that was very close for home use. Um, so our coronavirus test isn't yet available for home use, but we're working on that for authorization. But certainly the, the platform is flexible across different types of tests. Uh, Ayub, uh, Lauren from Facebook wants to know, uh, what will this cost for a family of four? Do you have any sense of that? So we don't really have a sense of the home use, um, like pricing and, and this sort of thing, because we've really right now in the in, in market for point of care. Um, and, you know, we've, we're always trying to lower the cost because at the end of the day, you know, we want to make this as accessible and as available as possible. We want to get the information to people. So we're focused on on um, making it as accessible as possible over time. But you know, uh, the ability to make more um, certainly goes a long way with that. And so being able to scale up um, is going to be very helpful. Well, Ayub Katak of Q Health, thank you so much for sharing this technology with us. Uh, as I said, really, it it could be such a game changer. So we'll be so uh, anxious to track your progress. Thank you so much, Ayub. Thank you. Now, in these uncertain times, some of the most powerful imagery we've seen has come from artists. And one that struck us recently was the iconic Time Magazine cover commemorating the over 200,000 Americans who have lost their lives to COVID. We talked to the artist, John Mavrudis, about what drove him to create this powerful depiction of the COVID-19 death toll. Time Magazine had gotten in touch with me to do this cover for the approaching 200,000 deaths mark on the coronavirus. We played around with a few different ideas. At the end of the day, we decided on just approaching this from a straightforward point of view from the first death in February from the coronavirus and each day logging the totals. At the beginning of the process, it was really fascinating to me and it was interesting and I was right handwriting out each date and the number of deaths for that date and you go line by line by line. After a while, I kind of grew numb in the process. You know, every three days we would have a 9-11 event. I looked up a bunch of cities that um, had the population of 200,000. Um, I ran across Akron, Ohio, and thought if something happened and all of a sudden that city disappeared off the map, there would be shock and horror. But that, there is nothing like this with this disease. But if you dig a little deeper, you see each one of them has friends and family attached to them and this number 200,000 which is just a number keeps growing because it's affected millions so I'm hoping that this was sort of a wake-up call for people to realize the totality and the scale of what was happening in our country and for people to take the common sense approaches to um, stop this And that was artist John Mavrudis sharing his heart through his art. Thank you to all of our guests and to all of you watching today. We are glad we had so many viewers from around the world. We realize this road is long, so I just wanna encourage everyone to hang in there and keep following the guidelines given to us by the scientists, specifically about wearing masks and social distancing. As we continue to say, we are all in this together. We'll see you next week on the road to a vaccine.